those either today. Um, so I'm so happy to be here with you because uh, I've worked with Parkinson's disease and in Parkinson's disease for a very long time. My dad had Parkinson's and that was when I first became familiar with it, but that was many years ago. And um, since then, and since my, I, I started at DU in 1988. So ever since then, I have done research in Parkinson's disease. I've presented all over the place. I've done all kinds of things and met lots of people and been exposed to lots of different things. In fact, I'm, I'm sorry, what's your name? Betty Grant. Betty Grant. I met Betty's daughter, Kim, when I used to do research with Dr. Kumar. So in one sense, I've known some of you or we've known people who have known people who have known people for a very long time. And I'm very grateful for that. I'm very, very grateful. So I do lots of research now. I retired basically from teaching about a year ago. But what I do is a lot of research now. So I'd love to know more about what Dr. Kern is going to present in fact. So I may have to come back and join you later this month to learn some things. Um, I work with dance for Parkinson's disease. Do any of you do the dance? Have opportunities to go dancing, dance with Parkinson's. Anyway, it's up the road from you a little ways, but um, that has been fun. Boxing, I've not ever tried. Anybody in here do boxing? Oh, all right, great. All right, well, I can learn some things from you guys as well. So I see you're getting ready. I am. <laughs> right, so um, anyway, it's, uh, it's a great joy of mine. And because I'm a psychologist, by training. Uh, I do have a private practice where mostly I just see people with Parkinson's or with ALS or other movement disorders because that's just something I know more about than other things. So I did bring some cards and I'll pass those around later if anybody's interested in that. Um, let's see, is there anything else about me that you should know? I've lived here in Denver most of my adult life. So um, it's interesting because when I do go around, certainly before COVID, uh, and present at lots of different meetings, national, international meetings, it is so interesting to me that people will say, oh, you're from Denver. Oh, and everybody is kind of, I want to say jealous, but they're very um, complimentary. They say that is one of the best places in the whole world to have Parkinson's disease. <laughs> because they have so many resources there. There are so many resources for people and with an active PAR group and so on and so forth, it's much more active here. You have a lot more resources than people do in many other places in the whole world. So I'm always very pleased to know that. You know, we kind of take things for granted, but that's not what other people think at all. So I'm very, very grateful for that. Um, years ago, because I've been associated with PAR for so long, I uh, had the privilege of really being a facilitator for the care partner group for about five years. So, and I've done lots of research with care partners as well as people with Parkinson's. Um, so I'm very grateful for all of that. Did it, have any of you gone through that PD self um, presentation with Diane Cook? Yeah, I helped Diane at the very beginning with that. So, um, she's done a fabulous job with that. I'm really, really grateful for all the energy that she's put into that. What are some other things that some of you have done related to Parkinson's, where you've tried to learn things or do things? I'm not involved with Parkinson's point in September. Anybody else? No dancers in here. Really? We should start getting to them. Yeah, they did take dancing 100 years ago, along with the Tom. 
her husband and I did dancing with an instructor who had been with Arthur Murray. And then she did classes just for people with Parkinson's. And then with COVID came along, we got to but she actually was offered them virtually during COVID. It was great. Yeah, in case you didn't hear, she was saying that she and her husband have taken dance lessons through Arthur Murray and that that group actually um, offered one specifically for people with Parkinson's. An instructor was with Arthur Murray. Yeah, it wasn't through Arthur Murray, but it was in their space. Oh, great. Great. Did someone else? Uh huh. Pass to pass. Oh, what's that? Multi day fat pack in a chart for people with Parkinson's. Really? Where is that? Where can we sign up? Yeah, sign up at the pass to pass level. Pass to pass? Is that the ASS or the TAS? And then is it two like the numeral or TO? TO. Uh huh. Oh, thank you. That's great. I want to talk to you at work. Okay. Love <laughs> that. Oh, that's great. Good. Thank you. You know, this is one of the wonderful benefits of support groups and of meeting together like this is being able to exchange information because we all know something, but we can also learn from other people. Just like you've heard me say, oh, I'd like to know that. What is Bruce or what is Dr. Turner talking about? So oh, actually, the, the company is in SciTech, and we're going to have a rep from that company. So I Kern did a, a web, webinar with them not too long ago. Uh, but one thing I do is I'm on the patient. Can you hear? The DBS Patient Advisory Board over at UC Anschutz. And if they have people in similar situations, say they're single, they live alone, um, they'll pass my phone number off to them. And, and it's great. I've talked to about a dozen people so far who are in the process of looking at PBS. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, you know, one of the things that I just learned from a client of mine, let's see, would have been last week, someone who had PBS and they just needed to put in a new battery, I think was the deal. And she said it was just amazing. She'd been depressed for a very long time. And with putting in that new battery, it's like she said, I don't need to see you anymore. I'm not depressed anymore. <laughs> But it was because of the DBS thing and getting the battery changed. I, I've never heard that before. That is just amazing. Yes. So it was like she was a thousand percent better. She said, I'll, if my battery runs down, I'll come and see you. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, so that was very interesting to me. We always, again, can keep learning things from one another. That's just part of the human condition, I think, no matter what. Anything else that anyone would like to share before we get started? I enjoyed the yoga class. Oh, the yoga classes? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Is that here? Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. oh, well, that's great. I had not thought about yoga, but yes, that's great. You know, you're doing exactly what I'm going to ask you to do in a minute, but go ahead. I was just going to say this to bring up her. I'm a DBS. I do it. I'm going to do a DBS called her. Oh, uh -huh. so oh great. Great. just a group that has it and just wants support. Water is going to support. Okay, and how do they get hold of you? Um, they can look at it on par or they can. Yeah, okay. All right, great. Thank you. And my husband does, and she has a senior service. Oh, good. And that's helpful. Oh, good. I'm so sorry. I was, you know, it's one of those things of us wearing masks these days. The woman with the mask got there and raised her hand, and I was looking at you, but you were the one who was talking. It was like, what's going on here? Anyway. Ventriloquism is going on, I guess. Not quite sure, but um, okay. Uh, let's see, I was going to tell you a couple of things in case you're interested, just stop me. But I've done uh, lots of research with the stem cell stuff. I don't know, somebody was just telling me there was something on the radio or on TV about yeah. stem cells and the future of that for Parkinson's. So there was the first stem cell um, person who was actually getting 
genetically modified stem cells directly injected into the brain, into the substantia nigra, and that is the first person who is having it done. So that's a huge step in the study. Right. Where the where was that person from? I I don't know, but it's it's you know of course experimental. It's part of a study, and we'll see. Right. I've been involved with that particular study for probably five, six, seven years, something like that. So, yeah, it's been in this kind of trial phase, experimental stage for a long time. And I'm pleased to hear about that. But the United States is so is a bit further behind other countries, which is why I asked where that was done, because of the FDA and because of all the rules that protect us all. We're not able to kind of progress ahead with some of this research like some of the other countries around the world. So there's a conglomeration of countries who help one another out. Everybody is kind of doing research, but we have to put it all together in order to know because one country just cannot do it all. It's too expensive. All the rules kind of hang people up, whether it's Sweden or Japan or wherever. So um, anyway, I know it's moving ahead, so I'm glad for that. Thank you. Uh -huh. Is there an institution in the United States that is participating with the other countries? Yeah. Yeah, there are various places. Who are they? Well, the main group has been in New York, but another person that I work with at the University of Colorado at California Irvine, they see some patients as well. So. Yeah. I'm not sure how much they, I'm not sure who is doing what exactly, but I can certainly find out. But anyway, lots is going on, um, which is wonderful for people with Parkinson's and for people who are care partners, because the whole idea is to have people live the best lives we possibly can, no matter what, right? Yeah. Okay, I'll go ahead and... Uh, I won't say I'll stop talking. I guess I'll just be more focused in what I'm going to say. Uh, one of the things that I would invite you to do, um, because I think we have until two o'clock, right? Uh, is to raise your hand and let me know if you have other things to add or contribute or add or whatever. Because it's so interesting always to me, even though I presented this and you know feel like I know something about this. Other people have come up to me afterwards and said, well, why didn't you include this? Why didn't you say that? And it's like, well, I never thought about it, but you're absolutely right. So I would just invite you to do that. I've already written down a couple of things that I've forgotten from other previous presentations here. So again, I can learn things from you and I appreciate your, um, participation. So don't be afraid to do that, but just let me call on you just in case I have something quite profound I was going to say in the next sentence. I'll just <laughs> wait for you. I'll, uh, if you can wait for me. Okay. Uh, yeah. Life is a challenge, isn't it? Whether or not you have Parkinson's. So also what I'm going to do here, I noticed as I was going through these slides, is that I kind of go back and forth between people with Parkinson's and care partners. So no one is left out, hopefully. You know, it just kind of goes back and forth. So um, that's the way it's set up. Uh, and I'm gonna probably ask you questions in the midst of this as well. So I'm so glad you let it go, let it be a two hour slot instead of just one, because there's just so much to cover. And so I appreciate your input as well. So. Lots of people have had challenges with just getting a diagnosis of Parkinson's in the first place. So how many of you have that problem? It's like really hard for some people sometimes to get a diagnosis. Yeah. So um, that's just something to help other people with sometimes. Um, like my brother-in-law, I think probably has Parkinson's, but I haven't said anything to him. And it'll be interesting as I kind of watch him go through this to see how long it takes somebody else to figure this out. Oh, that sounds terrible. But it's just that I've been around so many people with Parkinson's. You know, I 
And my, it was interesting when my dad had Parkinson's. I mean, we're talking about, this is a Tumwa, Iowa. Anybody know a Tumwa? <laughs> Denver, Denver goes through there from Chicago to Denver. There's a stop in a Tumwa. So, but when my dad was getting Parkinson's, uh, you know, the, the, there weren't many neurologists, let me say, in a Tumwa. And I went one time with him to that person and it was like my dad is so good at bluffing and laughing and telling jokes and all kinds of things he could distract him from asking important questions and that's really what happened you know it was like they had a great meeting but it's like the guy kind of missed all together the symptoms that my dad had it was like oh yeah so in here in a metropolitan area, you have more doctors to choose from and who suit you because people in rural areas that have kind of known this for a long time don't have that benefit. You just have to kind of take what you've got and that's it. So it behooves you all to learn as much as you can so you can either ask good questions or push a little bit because that's what doctors are in this business for as well is learning something. So they can learn things from you and you may just have to nudge people along a little bit anyway so yeah getting a diagnosis is sometimes a challenge for everybody uh did anybody have experienced this second bullet having anxiety or a relief that comes with a diagnosis it's like oh thank goodness finally i know at least what it is denial denial yeah that's a good way to cope with things for a while anyway isn't it uh if somebody back there raise your hand uh-huh yeah, yeah, you know, something is not quite right. So to have a name, to have somebody be able to be there with you, knowing that there's some medications that can be very helpful uh, along the way. Yeah, helps lots of people to at least have a diagnosis. Uh huh. I just saw my general practitioner do my annual exam and he just told me I might have it. But then I have to be scheduled for a neurologist and we don't get in there and actually show it's good thing with a few months away before I got in and see a neurologist. That that is uh, frustrating. Yeah, I know. Lots of frustrations with this disease. Yeah. Uh-huh. On the anxiety side, uh, my only encounter with uh, Parkinson's was uh, a friend, and I never saw a more miserable death than uh, except this poor guy. And when I was diagnosed, the neurologist I saw, um, he asked me about this guy's symptoms, and he said, I can assure you he didn't die of Parkinson's. It was something else, but that's, that was my only frame of reference, was this guy. Yeah, oh my God. yeah I, I would guess that your neurologist, I said, you don't die of Parkinson's. You die of something else, whatever that else might be. Uh, has anybody been told anything different than that? Okay. Um, yeah. So fear of the unknown, that's something that as we get older besets a lot of us. It's like, gosh, what's life going to be like here? What's life going to be like uh, with Parkinson's? What's life going to be like, you know, you can almost fill in the blank with lots of different things, right? And so that's just kind of a challenge that we all, as we age, maybe face. And another thing that sometimes people wonder about is who to tell. It's like if a person is still working, for example, it's like, oh, yeah, do I tell the people at my business, at my whatever? When is the right time to tell people? What's going to happen? What are the ramifications of letting people know I have Parkinson's? Are people going to treat me differently? Are people going to run the opposite direction? You know, what is it? So all of us, you know, who's, who's to know? Um, and what to do now? It's like, well, okay, so I have this diagnosis, and you were suggesting, hmm, you know, I don't make, yeah. maybe a good way to come for quite a while. Because, yeah, it, it, it takes a different trajectory with 
everyone more or less, and some people came in along quite well for quite a long time, and other people it's rather different and be much more um, of a quick onset. So um, yeah, and not sure I have a neurologist who understands Parkinson's. Again, that's less of a concern for people who are in metro areas because there are probably several different people you can go see. So it's a matter of well, who do you go to? Who do you go to? You know, and, and, and trying to figure that out. Whose personality is going to fit mine? How, how much information do I need? How much, anyway, all those things we've probably already been through. In terms of choosing a neurologist who is going to be best for you. So, um, some people also find it hard to plan ahead. It's like, oh, yeah, how far into the future am I going to plan? What? Yeah, so shall I plan to go on this trip to Europe three years from now? Well, maybe, how about this summer? We have to kind of make adjustments sometimes in terms of future plans because, frankly, who others knows what the future will be like? So. But having a chronic illness like Parkinson's adds something else to the mix, that's for sure. And so some of the challenges for care partners are really rather the same. Um, yeah. Anxiety or fear of the future, who to tell, what now, how can I help? That's something that lots of people wonder about. It's like, well, how's, how's my life going to change? How, what do I need to be prepared for as a care partner, um, how can I be helpful? And likewise, who will there be to help me? And some people have children. Oh, what? Not much older. Oh. I appreciate your chiming in. <laughs> you need that microphone. I'm kidding. Um, how can I help and who will help me? That's often a big question. Some people have children new, nearby who might be very helpful. Some people have children nearby who are terrified and don't in fact really want to help very much because it's like, I didn't really plan on this. So, um, you know, we all have different circumstances. It's just a matter of trying to figure out uh, what's going to work best for you. And that changes over time sometimes. Um, but it's something to think about ahead of time. It's like, what kind of help might I need? Where can I access help? Uh, does CAR have, CAR must have resources and so on? These kind of questions, is it through care? Yes, through, through our social worker, our patient, family services director, she's been with us for 24 years. Um, our entire team can help address things like this and work with other partners. So yeah, so if, if any of you have questions or thoughts or needing anything, don't hesitate to reach out to us. But here in treatment, uh, again, is our social worker who works with Laura. Yeah, and she's, as you say, she's been around forever. Uh, and I know her well, and she is just fabulous. She is just fabulous. So um, she can be very helpful. Um, and, and this next one, new roles. It's like, well, all right. And this can be true for many people as they age. It's like, well, um, we may need to take on other roles in life. Like you always have heard, I'm sure, of that example of, well, I've always done the checkbook. I've always taken care of the money. I know how to do this. You don't know how to do this. It's like, well, some of that may need to shift or change. And I'm sure there are other examples like that. Um, yeah, my sister and brother-in-law, sister-in-law and brother-in-law are very much in that um, stage of life because she is kind of crippled and not able to get around well. So my brother-in-law has had to take on many more chores and doing things that he didn't do in years past. And so it's a matter of kind of negotiating and also thinking ahead, what are some of those things that may need to change whether it be mowing the lawn or 
um, hiring a housekeeper or you know whatever it might be it's a matter of okay I at some point may need to start thinking about this if I was down on my hands and knees scrubbing my bathroom floor earlier this morning I thought oh, it's time for me to get a housekeeper get a cleaning person I was like oh I don't really like doing this but whatever one of the other things that um, is oftentimes part of a care partner's life is that feeling all alone. It's like, wow, other people don't know what this is like, but that's the reason that you're all gathered here. It's like there are other people who know what it's like. And that was one of the things when I was being a facilitator of the care partner group, that was so helpful for people because it was like there were other people who knew exactly what it was like. It's like, yeah, I know what that's like. I know what you're talking about. So, um, and that's again, one of the benefits of being in a metropolitan area is that there are support groups. There are other people who know pretty much what's going on. And that's very helpful. And the next one is kind of along with that, things are changing and I don't know what to do. Well, that's again, part of the benefit of being in a support group. It's like, there are other people who may be a little ahead of you in terms of all of this, and people who are a little behind you. So you can learn from one another about what are some hints? What did you do? How is my situation like yours or not like yours? So, um, and then the whole idea of planning ahead. We, many of us don't like to do that. Denial is a great help in that way don't want to think ahead about alternatives or where we are in life at this moment and that that might change by next month or the month after. If a person has a fall, if a person um, gets COVID, whatever, it's like, wow, we don't very much like this planning ahead business, but in, at some point, and, and I've found also that if you have a, a friend who is maybe roughly at the same stage, it's like you can go together to some of these retirement centers or you know whatever it might be. So you're not alone. It's like, oh, but there's somebody else who's hearing the same thing and that maybe we can have lunch or whatever after that and we can kind of compare notes and see what did you hear, what did you hear, and see what's best for you. That might be a way to go about that. Oh gosh, yeah, common things that go along with having Parkinson's. We've all already mentioned a little bit the frustrations. There are lots of frustrations just in life and having Parkinson's adds a new layer or two. And depression and anxiety, loneliness, apathy, uncertainty, fear, all these things are common in some way in life, but even more so with having Parkinson's. How come do you think? What even makes worse. it even worse? Mm -hmm. You don't know what's going to happen. Right. You don't know if you're just going to progress very slowly, very quickly. You don't know if you're gonna get dementia. You don't know, you don't know anything about how the disease is going to progress because everybody is different. Right. Very different. Every day is different. Yeah, yeah. sure is. It is. is. Yeah. Uh huh. Stuff with the lack of dopamine cause from that too. Yeah. 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 It's just part of the, lots of it is just part of the disease. You know, that's one of those one of those things is that lots of this depression, anxiety is really related to the disease. It's part of the disease process. So there's hardly anyone with Parkinson's who escapes some of this stuff. But a lot of it is just social as well. I don't want to say just social, especially since I'm a psychologist. <laughs> um, it's not a result of having the disease process, but it's certainly a result of uh, people slow down, um, less willing to go out. Um, you know, people just get more isolated over time because it's hard to get out, especially in bad weather and all that sort of thing. It's like there's more. Um, Loneliness, I dare say, perhaps during the winter, and but at least in the school district in Colorado, quite a lot of our 
shadowy, where there's where we have clear skies and weather. Is that part of the reason you move from the sunshine? Good for you. Anyway, um, yeah, and so that's a good thing to know is that what what is gonna lift your spirits, whether that be living in Colorado or being around people who kind of know what you're talking about, going out and getting as much physical exercise as you can, because that also is really helpful in terms of our mood, in terms of um, then mobility, all those kinds of things. So anyway, okay. I was just going to say that I think emotion and your diagnosis is so good about the Parkinson's disease. Emotion becomes your sixth sense. Your memory, um, all these things, you know, and make sure it's not That's a good point. Keep reminding us. Raise your hand again and say that again a few more times. That's always helpful. Yeah. We are really in charge of a lot of things about our lives and how we approach things, our attitude, our mood, and so on and so forth. It's like we can do something about that. We aren't just totally at the mercy of having Parkinson's. That's why some of that's why you're here. That's why you're coming to this presentation, but also why you do the support group and all of that. I want to be as good as I can about all of this. I want to do the best I can for myself because I'm the one ultimately who's in charge of this and who I am and how I approach things. So I applaud you all for coming today and uh, making getting out uh, a real practice that you have. Huh, so how to deal with frustration. And here's where I'm going to take notes because you all have something to say, I'm sure. And sometimes when movement becomes a little harder and takes longer to get going is to start early. I'm sure you know that. And just knowing that frustration is normal. So it's like frustrating as it is, that's the way it is. So how do you all deal with frustration? <laughs> yeah, that's a strategy. Anybody else? Exercise, yeah. Uh-huh. Breath. What does that do? That calms the central nervous system. What was that? Deep breath. Oh yeah. Deep breath. Yeah. Uh-huh. What's wrong with that? And just try to just take a step back. Stop. Then take a deep breath and then start from the Ah, uh, just take a pause. Yeah, when things are building up and you're getting more and more frustrated, you mean? I'm the shoes sometimes I have a little so slow, it's like a little Instead of like, oh, uh, great. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, just being patient with yourself is kind of like. And knowing yourself, I think that's such a good point. Knowing yourself and how you. What comes out of you when you get frustrated? Like, what, where do you go with that? Is it yelling and screaming, or is it, it is for you, huh? What? Yeah, the screaming and cussing. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> All those things. Yeah, 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 yeah. Right. And knowing, knowing what you're asked to do, and maybe what might be another strategy or another way to put with that. So thank you. Yes, that's great. I love that. Just that. Uh -huh. Very supportive family. So, that makes a big difference, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh huh. I had a clutter. I had a clutter just last needed. Yeah. Kim was over my daughter's over one day, and on my computer had problems. And uh, she all parents and had something. And uh, she says, there's a clutter. Now I'm living in a parents. <laughs> Clutter. Yeah, that can be rather person crazy. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Well, and and then we can blame the computer sometimes, right? <laughs> or anyway, yeah. It's important to be able to uh, know who we are and how we're going to respond to things, and also just accepting the fact that yeah, frustration is just kind of built into this stupid disease because you're always coming up against something. But it's not as easy as it used to be. And that is frustrating. Mm -hmm. 
I've experienced with frustration, whatever I'm doing, especially when I'm trying to learn something and retain something, um, and it's not, I'm not doing it very well, sometimes I'll just shut down and I'll do what a friend says, go dark. Mm -hmm. And I'll just sit on the sofa and watch YouTube videos for the rest of the day and just not think about it. Well, sometimes that's a wonderful way to go about that. Instead of just keeping getting more and more and more frustrated, it's like, okay, just switch gears and do something else. We'll come back to it later, tomorrow, whatever, and maybe it will be easier. And maybe you'll have see the light at the end of the tunnel. So, uh huh. I was just going to say, <clears throat> my brother, if I go to something that I don't like in there, so if it's, if it's something like, for me, it's my rigidity and my fingers and stuff that's really bad. So I go on to something big, like maybe watering plants outside or something like that, and then work my way back to that. Uh -huh. uh -huh. I think it's very easy to do. So I just go to something in front of it, it's easy, you can do, and then walk into it. Right, right. Instead of keeping uh, hanging your head against your roof wall, so to speak, just switch here to do something different. During graduate school, I think someone gave me this wind-up woodpecker. <laughs> and it's one of those things that you, you know, go like that with the rubber on the back of it. And then I would stick it on the end of my bookcase. And then you wind up the woodpecker to go, oh, 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 oh. like beating his head against a brick wall. Like, yes, sometimes. Sometimes that was helpful. It's like, yeah, that's the way it is right now. And I need to switch here to do something different because I'm not figuring this one out, whatever it is. So, uh, okay. So what to do about depression and anxiety? So these, I'm sure you've all heard these or done these before, medications, psychotherapy, exercise, support groups, Focus on a hobby or other activity. How many of you have hobbies or other things you use to distract yourself? Uh -huh. I like to do reading reading when my hands are shaking, but great. Beading, doing yeah. other things with your hand. Uh-huh. Oh, oh, that's great. Did you did you with one of these things, that's great. You have power tools that you're using. But right now it's looking okay. Oh, that's great. Good. Somebody else? Uh -huh. We're working outside. Oh, okay. And now it's getting that time of year. Yeah. That's wonderful. And safer than using power tools, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure you're very careful. And it must be something that you really love. <laughs> okay, any, oh, uh huh. Golf course. Really? Trying to get involved. Oh, that's great. You can go as far as trade use, but that's for sure. It's also for the pressure. Right, but it's worth it at this point. Huh? That's where I'm being helpful with the here. Well, I'm flat. I'm really flat. Thank you. A big start, by the way. I used to be a woodworker, and my wife is scared to death of me trying on that power saw. Make sure your heads are on. <laughs> That's a uh, that's an issue I need to talk to a father. I mean, yeah. He doesn't on uh, or off. I know, he's never quite makes it. Anyway, so about you back there? I do a lot of reading, and I find myself delving into the characters and the plot of the story, and everything disappears around. Oh, wonderful. That's lovely. Anybody else? Uh -huh. Coloring. Really? Ooh, yeah. this one is a coloring book? Oh, yeah. That's great. Lots of different things we can use um, to help ourselves through some of those times. 
Mindfulness. Does anybody know what that is or practice that? No. What's that? It's in the moment. Oh, being in the moment. Yeah. We won't go into that today, but again, it's a way of taking yourself away, almost like you're reading. It's like, okay. And spirituality, anyone? Prayer. I mean, yeah, prayer. Everyone does that. Lots of people do that in your own way, whether it's doing it corporately with other people or individually, like meditation is something that can be done together with other people or with yourself. And massage? Really? Tell us more about that. some people so there are lots and lots of different things and boxing as well so um yeah lots of things to do to help our depression and anxiety besides talk therapy and medications lots and lots of things we can do to help ourselves and what to do about loneliness loneliness seems like it's been a big topic in the news in the last year or two um and it, what does anybody have to say about loneliness and how you combat that? Anybody? Maybe nobody's lonely here. <laughs> what? <laughs> anybody? Uh huh. You know, I think that being with loneliness, even if you have a partner or in my case, my, my older daughter, um, sometimes it's hard to own this. Doesn't matter how many people are around you, you're, 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 you feel horrible at home. I mean, it's, so I, I'm looking for an out. Anybody have suggestions? Anybody have some suggestions about how to combat loneliness? There are several, oh, there are a lot of different uh, Zoom groups. I know it's not face to face, but first I take part in one. There are people from the US and Canada and all over um, every, every Sunday night. There are monthly meetings, bi weekly meetings. PAR is a huge resource for different support groups. And then you meet people and make friends in those support groups. Um, it's it's easy because I live out in the country, so it's very easy to isolate. And um, if you want afterwards, give me your email address. I'll send you the link to that group. Okay. And I think Carrie, as you were mentioning, runs two support groups online. Is that? Yeah, we, we have the 45 monthly support groups, uh, one here in Castle Rock, we have 83 exercise classes, uh, two here in uh, Castle Rock, we just started the second one, it's a non-contact boxing, uh, we have our support groups, we have TBS support groups, we have Young Onset, we have Care Partner support groups, we have upwards of 20 to 25 educational events throughout the year, uh, so our, we call ourselves I mean, we serve roughly 15 to 16,000 people. Um, we have different committees to get involved. We have different groups. So there's all sorts of things you can do to get involved. I encourage you all to take advantage of, of those activities, especially our support groups and our exercise classes. Because as I think Larry said, one person who has Parkinson's is different than the other person. And we try to 
understand that there's flooding off or all sorts of different ways to get involved. So you might not like boxing, but maybe you like Tai Chi or the dance or aquatics or what have you. So there's all sorts of different ways and things you can do to really not feel that isolation or that loneliness and be a part of the community. One of the things that are coming up anyway in June, first Sunday June, is the wellness walk in the Torchkin Park. That's a well attended event. There's a lot of exhibitors there. I, in fact, the first one I went to, I met the doctor that did my DBS surgery in January. And so I encourage you to do that. People aren't going to come to you, so you have to go out there. And it helps to know all the different opportunities and offerings there are. Because yeah, and so if people, do you have to type in Parkinson Association of the Rockies, or how about if you just do PAR? You can do PAR. You can do Parkinson's Colorado. You can do all sorts of different things. We have a decent SEO, which is what's on Google. A lot of you took the packet that was over here. That has the full list of exercise classes, the full list of support groups, all of our educational events. Um, has a little flyer about the care of our social worker, has our special events, as Larry mentioned the walk, which I mentioned at all. But so yeah, there's if there's anything you need, please reach out to us. Um, again, we're here to, to help you along this journey. I did one. I teach the Parkinson boxing class, so uh, there's probably five or six people in here that come to that class, and. Um, I just want to stress that I think it's a good community. We really support each other. Uh, we do balance work, coordination, some strength. So it's not a full hour of just boxing. So we do about half and half. Um, try to work at everybody's different levels. Um, everybody takes it at their own pace. And I think we've got a great group. So you're welcome to come and check that out. And Thank you. No one's ever left with a black eye. Yeah. <laughs> where, where is it? Where do you have um, it? Tuesdays, we are here in Castle Rock off of Wolfenberger. It's called uh, Rocky Mountain Self Defense and Fitness. So it's over by Plum Creek Veterinary. It's Kinner Street. So just kind of by the Burger King. Wendy's is over there. And Thursdays is at the Recreation Center in the Woods. Yeah, three, three o'clock to four o'clock. And she's really good. Uh-huh. I was very reluctant when I asked why I first had that support group. Because I just thought another support group. You know, and I'm not even the one with Parkinson. But now I can't wait to hear. Because and I can't really there's something about being there, you know, is Gives you a little hope. You know, you see people who are further advanced and people who are less advanced. And I, you know, it's going to scare me. And it didn't. It really, it really helps to just kind of go and listen and talk to people. Yeah. So I learned my lesson. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Yeah. Uh, it can be very, very helpful and give, give you hope, as you said. Yeah. And you can give other people hope as well. It's like, Everybody who goes uh, participates in one way or another, whether or not you say anything, you're there, as you say. And that is extremely valuable. Well, they're all, um, yeah, this is why we live in Littleton, so it's way over there on our side of town. But I'm sure they can give you some lines on where this is. Yeah, it's just part of the support group. Yeah. And you said there's a flyers up here. That yeah, the flyers on our website as well. Like I said, there's support groups for everybody, um, all over the state. And my own. And my own. I went to the support group right in this room for dementia, and I've done it for eight years. It's some people have come for eight years. They now socialize together, first events together, and they talked about their spouses, this is a caregiver group, and they're a family. And they call each other. They even meet once a month on their own outside of the, the set. It's just, it's a family. Yeah. And I can't wait to find them so much. Oh, I know. I, know. I still think about um, the group that I facilitated. 
because they were there a lot. Just wanting people to get hands on the support for care for the workers for young on the set. Like, so my husband, um, we won't talk about my age, obviously, I don't know how to but he's like seven years younger than I am. So he's in the working community. And so for him to find a support has been nearly impossible. He's even got to carry his she has a Zoom one. He can't attend them because they're in the middle to the end of his work day. So there's nothing like in the evenings or on the weekends. Does anybody have any ideas? So we do have a um, uh, early onset or young onset support group that is that takes place on Fridays at like five o'clock. Actually, it was just moved to Saturdays. Saturdays, yes. <laughs> we just developed a young onset sort of council, if you will. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> so you're aware of a bunch of stuff, but yeah, we recognize that is a challenge. Yeah. Um, Look like in PMV Alliance or like any of those other national orgs, because they have a lot of support groups, even for like adult children. For people I don't know, I'll have to get with you. I know um, PD Advent has one for adult children. Um, I borrowed that to my children. I think PMV Alliance may have one. Well, we could. Okay, let's move on a little bit. I would I would like to say that there are a lot of people on social media, not necessarily I mean Facebook has several different uh, support groups. Um, pages, I guess. People with Parkinson's is the one I think of because I'm a moderator of that group. Um, there is on TikTok, if you just search Parkinson's, you're going to find a lot of people in there. Um, there's, there's a community on social media of people with Parkinson's. Oh, wow, that's great. And during the week, like the Sunday night uh, Zoom call, during the week, these people will reach out to others and how do you do it? And how did your DDS go? How did the program go? How did your doctor visit go? And we'll call each other and reach out to each other. So they may be on another side of the country, but they're still, you know, they're close by social media. Yeah, it's amazing. I was, when you mentioned that one, the DDS, if I remember the lady who, and she was leaving me, um, said, you know, it was because they adjusted the setting. It wasn't just getting the battery, it was adjusting the setting that the feature of her terrible refreshment she had forever. I've never seen her in several years look so good. She looked happy, she looked relieved. It was like a new person. So it was just this adjusting setting, which again, I've never heard of that as being one of the kind of outcomes. <laughs> Yeah, so anyway, it was great. Um, let's see, I think we've kind of covered these. Um, yeah, reaching out to people and particularly now with all the other social media things that are possible. And what to do about apathy. What does apathy mean in your own life? What's apathy? Do you all know? You just don't want to do anything. Don't want to do anything. That sounds familiar. Yeah, with COVID and so on, that was kind of a, yeah, everything was kind of taken away from us. And now it's a little hard to kind of let it be again. It's kind of sanctioned apathy because we need to stay away from one another. So, but now that's not a part of life so much, the needing to distance ourselves from one another. But it's that matter of, oh, yeah, I just don't feel like it. I'm worn out. I'm tired, I, whatever. And so these are just some ideas to help us kind of stay out of that mm, malaise, that just being worn down by things. And just to socialize with others, go again to a support group, keep up a routine. It's like, you know, once we let things go, like me cleaning my kitchen floor or my <laughs> bathroom floor, once we let things go, it's hard to get back to them sometimes. So keeping up a routine, exercise, again, all these things that I don't need to really read to you, but staying engaged with life. Well, that is going to mean different things for different ones of us. And maybe it's like going to the golf course. 
It's like, no, it's not going to be like it used to be, but you're going. And that in itself uh, is very encouraging. It's like, I got there. I, I did it. And it makes us feel not quite so um, that we can't do it. If we stay home sometimes and don't do things, that can kind of get reinforcing. It's like, well, I didn't go yesterday or the day before, or the day. I guess I don't want to do that anymore. It's like, no, 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 no. We have to make ourselves do things sometimes in order to keep fit, in order to keep going. We need to take ourselves and have the initiative, like we talked about a minute ago, of um, it's up to us to kind of keep ourselves going sometimes, whether it be by hiking or finding a hobby or doing whatever. It's like we need, if we're going to make the most of our lives wherever we are, it's up to us to kind of do that, figure out going hiking, figuring out some other routes, some other things that you want to do that are going to keep you engaged with life. So those things are important. Get plenty of sleep. Does anybody have trouble sleeping? In here? No. <laughs> <laughs> what is that from? What did they tell you in the Parkinson community? Why? Or maybe they say it's not Parkinson's. I don't know why I'm not sleeping. Anybody? A lot to worry about. A lot to worry about. Yes. No matter what in life, it's like, wow, oh, that's going to keep getting easier to keep getting more crazy. How about you? I don't know why I can't sleep. <laughs> it's something that I've had for a while. Really? And, uh, I taught school for a long time. That makes you <laughs> wake up in the middle of the night. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah. There can be lots of different things. Anybody else with sleep problems? All I want to do is sleep. Oh, is that right? Oh, my gosh. I think that. Wow, I wish I had that. <laughs> this is the first. <laughs> yeah, I'm having terrible trouble sleeping. Actually, a woman who shared the same office in the same place, um, I do, uh, she had breast cancer about a year and a half after I did. It. And she said, oh, what medication are you taking here to keep your head from having Answer again. I told her, and she said, oh, I have just been reading the signs on that medication, and it says it causes or leads to sleeplessness. So it's like, you got to be kidding. So at right. least I have a reason why I am not sleeping. Although, yeah, that night after she told me that, it was like, oh, it's the best sleep I've had for <laughs> One night, <laughs> I haven't felt well at all. Like she. Oh, Ambient and Seroquel. What's that? Ambient and Seroquel. Anyway, there are lots of different things that we can yeah. marshal together. Anyway, get plenty of sleep if we can. We will try. And achieving one goal a day or a week. Does anybody do that? Kind of set a goal for yourself and then it's like, okay, I'm going to do this today. What do you do? I think I'm kind of, people kept asking us, what do you guys do all day? <laughs> and I'm like, I don't know, let's figure it out. But I have a calendar where I can see sort of the whole week. That's you know, where I might like, feel fill in, doing something, what's coming, and it just it just is better management for oh. to live instead of having it only in here. Yeah. It's just right there for us to see, and it keeps us, I think it keeps momentum. Yeah, and makes you feel good about the fact that yeah, you've actually accomplished this. Yeah. Huh? That's a great thing. That's a great way to look at that. Perfect. Thank you. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you. I'm a practice procrastinator. Tell us more about that. I don't recommend. <laughs> you want to tell us about it later? <laughs> Not as far as achieving goals, huh? That's good. I knew you were in trouble when I walked in the door. He was here a little early. Um, yeah, so that's one of the parts of the uh, PD self program, isn't it? It's goal setting. It's like that can help you help in general. It's, it's 
leads to self-efficacy is what it's called. It's like being able to get a goal and figure out the steps that you need to take to get to that goal and then doing those steps and then feeling like, wow, I accomplished that. I did it. Whether it's like um, taking a walk around the neighborhood or writing a letter or thank yous or whatever. It's setting a goal, but not too high a goal, a goal that you can achieve between this week and tomorrow or the next next week, whatever, and then being able to accomplish that. It's like, it does a lot for our self-esteem. It's like, I thought I couldn't do anything. I would do a lot of, especially now that I have Parkinson's or whatever it might be. It's like, oh, I just thought I had lost most of the rest of my life. But if we're able to set a goal and then figure out the steps you need to do to get there, and then you actually accomplish that, it's like, I was able to do that. I was able to do that. So, you couldn't break that into the house of the day because of the chain of exercise. But uh, last summer, he was just so happy that he started out with just cowboy moving and then tearing out. Uh, as we discover the changes in the system, he has many goals to his own plan of exercising. We do, uh, you know, while well, the class, he gets to the class of two things. He makes determination to do his own set of exercises. You know, it's proud. Uh, mm -hmm. Instead of watching it. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yes, it's steps forward. Absolutely. Anybody else? Some things that you've done that have helped yourself? Uh -huh. Here's a, a different thought. How do I deal as a with somebody who, who is who has empathy and how do I get him to do things without turning into a big day? That's a wonderful, wonderful question. Anybody? I've got a puppy. So, I mean, I have to get up and feed her and take her out and train her. Wow. I just can't sit around anymore. So the puppy could be the nag instead of you. Yeah, that is pretty tough. Anyway, I'm more about the language. Hey, why don't we go and do this for the week? Instead, you need to get up and do that. We're doing it with them, even though they're always with them. And that's a great goal. You don't play my book. I'm still getting up in the car. I'm just trying to start. <laughs> you can say something like, hey, Maria, I want to do the activity you guys to be close together. Or the words you want to do it. I do the words together. Yeah, but the reason why I'm not going to say close Yeah, 
like let's go try this or any more group. Okay. Um, again, I'll just um, say that at the beginning of Dance for Parkinson's, that started in Brooklyn, um, there have been, I think it's been around 20 years now, for a long time. But I used to go do research at Columbia in, in New York. And so when I would go, they would invite me and want me to come to one of the Dance for Parkinson classes. And so I would schedule things so I could be there at that time because it was a dance for Parkinson's class. And I just, I, I was totally enamored of it. It was just wonderful. And the people who went to that class, it was often with the person with Parkinson's and their care partner. And it would, it would be in a room that's about four times this big and people would be spread out and the leaders were Fabulous, just fabulous, because they learned about Parkinson's really from the people who were there. And um, I remember one man in Texas was just totally bent over like this, but he was doing his best, you know, to keep up and to do things. So people were at all different levels. And it was so interesting to realize that. Um, Many of them had never danced before and couldn't care less about dancing, but because they all kind of belonged to a support group there in Brooklyn, they went because other people said, oh, yeah, no, it's lots of fun, it's so fun, so fun. And, uh, and they got to be really, really friendly. So some of those people I've kind of known for years. And it was interesting several years ago because they then would give a performance, actually. Um, in the performance space there in Brooklyn, because this group was came from the Mark Millett Dance Group. I don't know if anybody knows that. It's a very probably the premier modern dance group in the world, really. They are fabulous. And so these Parkinson folks gave the performance, and they've done this right for years um, in the performance space there in Mark Millett's group. And so from some of these people, again, I had known for several years, they said, oh, yeah. These people who used to belong to these groups, this group, moved to South Carolina. So another couple and I, uh, they went, they went down to South Carolina to visit these people simply because they had known each other, they became friends through, through the dance, all of that. And most of those men, I'm sure, never would have took anything in their whole lives. But they somehow got dragged along and they loved. They totally loved it. And again, would come every week, every time. And it was all very inspiring to me. And um, I remember once early on, you know, they have people, you know, you could just kind of dance around, do whatever. And one lady came up to me and said, You do very well. What are you guys? Your dance class is there. I take it really by yourself. <laughs> anyway, they're very friendly, very sweet. There's one, I think it's on South Santa Fe, you probably know, where the dance for parts of the That's a deletion question or exercise question there, but it's in your back. Yeah, yeah, they, they used to be downtown at uh, Denver. I don't know how about it. I think they have used it. Anyway, yeah, I've been to the dance for Parkinson's for a little while, but it's uh it's totally wonderful because it's you can kind of do your own thing, although they're teaching you and all of that, but um everybody's at a different level, so it's one of those things that gets people moving, but you also get to know other people, which is one of the things that is of such benefit. Again, the social support aspect of all these things is worth everything for our veterans. Um, I remember one of the first times I went to one of these dance classes in Brooklyn, a lady said, oh, well, we're having a dinner here tonight at our house. Would you like to come? I'm like, I don't know this person from but she invited me, and it was like, wow, you know, that 
that again is worth so much to be included, cared for. Everybody's the same. It doesn't matter what your background is. And um, I was just amazed at that. Not so. anyway. Let's see. Um, apathy. Get out there and do something. Kind of is part of the scheme of helping with that. What to do about uncertainty? It's like well. We have lots of uncertainty. I'm going to put this down here. I keep, I wandered around a little while ago thinking, where did I put my blog? <laughs> so you can remind me, I better find it here. Um, what to do about uncertainty? It's like, wow, do we have lots of uncertainty in life these days? Never mind Parkinson's. It's like, well, finances, money, wars, guns, it's like, sheesh. Yeah, so uh, the first thing I put up there was respecting your style and need for certainty. Some people have a lot more need for certainty in their lives and predictability and all of that than other people control things. <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say that. But, uh, yeah, some people, it's easier to kind of roll with whatever's going on than other people and other times in our lives. It's just not so easy to do. We need a little more predictability and stability and knowing what the heck is going to be happening tomorrow or what we're going to have for supper tonight, which is kind of what I'm thinking of right at the moment. But, <laughs> um, and what areas can you address now? There are some things in life we can kind of plan ahead for, think about ahead of time. And then there are other things that just kind of hit us out of the blue. So let's just think about what we can do now. And some of those things are legal matters, like will and power of attorney and uh, uh, tax matters, whatever, trust, planning ahead. Each person's uh, financial situation is their own. So anticipated changes in financial status, like whether or not uh, or you keep your money uh, and future travel arrangements. It's like, well, again, when do we plan that trip? How long can I anticipate that I'm going to be well enough to go here or there or other places? That's really something I'm thinking about now, uh, especially having had cancer. It's like, hmm, I think I need to think about some of these things now rather than anticipating that I'm going to live forever. Hmm, I think that's not going to happen. So anyway, all of us have these things. It's like, oh, I don't really want to think about that. I don't really want to go there in my thinking, but I think I need to think about that. Um, yeah, anticipated modifications to the home environment. Yeah, some of us want to anticipate that we're going to stay in our homes forever and ever. So that might be more of a salient item than some others. Um, and preferences for long-term care. Again, I have enough folks in my life, either relatives or friends, who are kind of at that point along here. And um, it has certainly helped me to think ahead because it's like, well, you know, things life is not going to go on the way it has forever and ever. For most of us, anyway. So it's a matter of how, how do I deal with that? And um, who can you delegate to take care of particular arrangements? Um, this has become an issue for me in a sense because uh, a fr I have two friends for whom I'm power of attorney. Well, you know, 20 years ago, it's like, oh, sure, no problem, no problem. I'm happy to do that. But all of a sudden, I get a call and it's like, well, okay, your friend is moving into, moving from independent living into nursing home care or whatever it's like and you are the power of attorney and we need you to do x y and z and it's like ah, no i don't know how to do x y and z i think i better figure that out so anyway it has become more real to me because it's become real for other people and i'm the one who's going to be responsible somebody just called me i think a couple days ago saying oh well, you're the power of attorney for X person, and she has these financial things that need to be addressed. It's like, you gotta be kidding. What do I know about that? So anyway, those are the kinds of things that 
some of us may be dealing with down the way. So it's a matter of paying attention and figuring out some things rather than being sideswiped by them at some more critical time. It just happens that that my, this particular friend they were calling me about with the financial stuff, it's like she is perfectly capable mentally of handling most anything, far more than I am. So it's like, you know, the social worker place said, oh my gosh, she can, you know, don't call the power of attorney if she doesn't know anything. Ask the person herself. She knows all about this. It's like, oh, thank heaven. So, because she gives them a hard time about most everything. So it's like, good, call her, call her. Yikes. And what to do about fear. Yeah. Because fear, I think, probably can, becomes a little more uh hmm. Was that your phone again? There's not the song again. <laughs> yeah. I didn't anyway. have one up in up in Beaver Creek because I couldn't snipe ski because of the bark. So you know it's not cheap to snow ski anymore. Or get the sun. Bar cheaper than fall and snow ski and Yeah. 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 Anyway, so what to do about fear? Yeah, just to acknowledge it. It's like, yeah, it's kind of in the background for most of us regarding something or another, whether it's the world situation or our financial situation or, you know, whatever, guns, all those kinds of things. And to talk about it with a trusted friend or in a support group or with a healthcare professional. And focus on gratitude and what you can do Again, this kind of gets back to the self-efficacy. It's like, what can I do? What can I still accomplish? What is part of me that um, is very precious to me and that I can do and that will make me happy in a sense? What is it? And being able to do those things again. Um, my undergraduate degree in music. I said, well, I can either do that or not do that. But when I do that, I'm reminded, yes, this is part of me. First of all, I'm a musician before and anything else. I, uh, this reminds me of who I am. This is an important part of me. And it's important for me to do some of that in order to kind of remind myself of the fullness of who I am, of the of who we all are, you know, talking about myself, but I'm sure you have that. It's like the woodworking thing. It's like that's part of who you are and that you really love, right? Yeah. So to have to give that up would be sad. And there may be other things that you can do, but yeah, we need to remember who we are and to be able to use that somehow however it is and to also be able to teach that to other people sometimes <laughs> so i have a when i was visiting my family in arizona a few weeks ago i have a friend who is a wonderful artist she, she has a brother and part of my birthday present that she was giving me was teaching me how to do watercolor <laughs> I, I will never be an artist. I will never be wonderful at that, but she was teaching me. She took the time and the trouble and the effort, and I was very grateful because I'm sure that was wonderful for her. Well, and it was wonderful for me because it's like, oh, now maybe I could, maybe I could learn to do this a little more. And then a few days after that, she sent me a book, How to Do Watercolor. <laughs> okay. Anyway, uh, so it's finding those things and sometimes passing those along because it's like I'm grateful that Vicki gave me part of herself as an artist and encouraged me to do something like that too. So I'm sure you all have some of that, whether it's cooking or baking or uh, what are, what are some of the things that you have and that you love and that make you part of who you are? Can we? What else? Wordle. 
We're going to see what you're doing back in now. <laughs> Yeah, you have raised your hand then, sorry. Uh, block your hand. I did? Oh, well, yeah. I thought maybe you were just thinking. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. But yeah, hurdle is very, it's just such a great thing every day for the mind, and you can share it with others, and just have fun in that way, or frustration. <laughs> have fun. That's really important. Mm -hmm. So, what is it, whatever it is that brings you joy and helps you to have fun, like, wow, I haven't. In a long time. I wonder if what that would be. So, with the same, go ahead. I don't know. I ain't been showing horses for years. And really, really, really upset me how to do it. And there's nothing I find to replace it. They don't crochet. <laughs> so, I, I, it's hard. You know? To give up, it's hard. And to find something else that might replace it in some funny way. Well, I think that I need something more physical. But anybody have some suggestions? Uh huh. I think you have to adapt yourself to what you want to start. And you have to find something that makes you feel worthwhile. Maybe you have to find something that improves your situation and then you're responsible for that. And it, uh, I call that the power of one. And the uh, University of Wisconsin, a number of years ago, when they first start, started studying uh, the Effects so, of the um, yoga or, or whatever, and how the ultra underlies much of your mind as your physical capability. The last thing I think is important is to always realize that you have a better than somebody else. And then I was a volunteer for children's for years. And I had to tell people I had to walk in through the, the uh, emergency room door, which was what we used to have to do at the old hospital. And right away, I put on my hat for being a volunteer. And it was, well, I made a difference in my life. Realized that I could do something I had for all. You know, I'm back today, a bad month, bad hour. 50% of the time, you have the responsibility of making it your time and your 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 help. But I, 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 um, the, the strange thing is, that what I can do is to try and link all those together. That if you can go out and go for a walk, you can sleep better that night. Oh, good. Thank you very much. <laughs> Oh, so I, I, I just uh, too often we look for solutions rather than what the solution does for you. We need to think beyond ourselves. Don't no, excuse me, but uh, I, I, when I got my dad had Parkinson's, so I have a good reference and. But what is important to me is that um, you, just, you just can't give up. I heard that. That's what my father said. I just say something. But the part of me for uh, being emotional, that's one thing I did find was the irritation. When you cry in front of 2,000 and some people, and you're talking about a certain patient, you, you uh, get kind of embarrassed. But I think you. I think you'll get over it. Well, we, uh, I urge all of you, based on my experience, to dig deep, as we used to say, and to say that I'm going to improve in this area, whether it be a relationship, 
which I own to an like to own and like. And uh, I think those of us that have a good marriage are really lucky. And if we don't just take it for granted. We used to run a lot, ran a couple of marathons, and we lost a fearful 21. And at mile 21, your body says no. And your mind has to say yes. And you can't give up. So that's me. <laughs> Part of me. I think what you've got to do with heart disease is not be afraid to talk about it because I play golf obviously on this map. And right now, if there's a new person in our force on the you know, there's a I know, and a new person, I'll immediately tell them because it took quite a bit of effort on my part. My mind to process being a macho male thing is not to like the team. I come home and drink tea because I'm using this just ball of paper because of my heart. When I do that, then that kind of relief is going to have an anxiety when I'm going to miss it. And so I think that's important. The other thing is the other day I was in Arizona as well. I was born, went to a men's building store. And I decided that I wasn't doing very well as far as walking and so on and so forth. I was a couple of them And so I meet and told the sailors who had a fine sense. So we're going to go around wondering what's going on with this crazy guy. <laughs> so I think it's easy to overlook that. Plus, we're being an advocate for our disease, right? It's good. I have someone who's got a good letter and it's good or whatever. Yes, thank you. I don't think I saw you in Tucson, but maybe I did. Oh, well. Um, let's see. Yeah, we're almost done here, but um, what to do about fear? I think just realizing that it's a common word. I you have the fear of I am but I have the fear of um, being consumed by it because I am my husband's advocate. I go to every appointment and advocate for it. I'm fighting with insurance for it. I'm making sure he takes his meds on time. And it's it can be all consuming at times. And you have I have the fear of losing myself in it at times. Mm -hmm. and, you know, and I love him too. And I want to be there so I want to say um but you have that fear of um losing yourself in yourself. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing it. Yeah I would, I would do the same thing with her. Um you know, it's <clears throat> that'd be the first time somebody couldn't hear my voice. <laughs> you know, I've been an avid cyclist for over 30 years, and one of these days I'm not going to be able to do that. And that has been like like her horses to me. And I know how I'm going to deal with that. But I've accepted that from this point out, it's going to be a let go of one thing right after another. That's kind of the way this thing is. And I've just decided that the best thing I can do right now is do everything I can for her. And it's okay for me to be that. You know, I don't lose myself in me. You know, I want to do everything I can to make this as easy for her as possible. And, um, you know, we'll see, you know, that's the plan. I don't know if it'll, it'll work out that way. And everyone's a little different. Yeah. Circumstances are different. You guys back there, any partners, do you have any thoughts or questions? What I was thinking when she was talking was um, they were just talking about having an angle or a care partner. 
not to say yes, I have all these doctor's appointments, let's try to spread them around, but have because you feel like you have to do so many things on that, but also have some time for yourself um, if there's a possibility for that with a neighbor or a friend to be hanging out with them. Self-care. I know that part of it. Try to make a goal of doing something. Not self with selfish, but self And not the good Get that. <laughs> Anyone know? I feel like a lot of these slides you can just add learning how to ask for help. Because I think so many of us just get ourselves on skin. If I can't ask anybody to help, or I don't want to use the help too soon. You know, I think a lot of it just comes to that friend who's really good at this. So I'm learning from her. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think just learning to ask for help. Like, okay, I you know, I need facts. These people will come help me. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they don't know, then they're not going to come help. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Actually, that's where I was pointing for having a list as a caregiver of things you can't seem to get to. So if a friend does say, can I help? You got your list. And you know what? If you could pick up the plants I ordered and deliver them to the board, whatever it is, or make that list of things are not happy, it would be nice to let the digital support. Anybody else? Let's move on. I think we're about at the end here. Um, yeah, we've kind of covered those. And we've kind of covered these too in some uh, long term goals, but these can also, some of these can be done uh, because they need to be done now. The legal ones, financial ones, travel, all that sort of thing. Some are long distance depending on your living situation, but some we can do more uh, readily right away and need to be done. Um, and thinking again about who can you delegate to take care of particular arrangements. It's not so different than what you were just saying about having a list of things that maybe other people can do for you. So um, it's important to be able to let go of some things and not feel guilty about it. And other people really do want to help. So, uh, yeah, some things can be postponed. Uh, and that bottom one is what we were just talking about, openness to help in the future. Yeah, we can, people do want to help and we need to feel like we won't be guilty if we ask other people for help uh, and making adjustments along the way. It's like, wow, that's true for all of us. Life is gonna change, things in life change as we age all of that um and so be able to kind of roll with the punches in a sense um and we can't know now some things that may need to be done in the future so it's just this whole thing of being open to what is going to be happening in life and we just don't know what that is lots of times so um for some people it's trusting in our relatives or friends or God or whatever that might be. It's like, well, there are lots of things that are just kind of beyond us. So uh, being open to all kinds of help is going to help us manage things. So again, what resources do we have? Just thinking of all these things that uh, can help us navigate through life, family and friends, and a sense of humor and laughter, positive attitude, all those things that we've kind of talked about a little bit and even sharing who you are. So uh, reaching out and teaching other people things like watercolors it's, um, <laughs> can benefit both the receiver, the recipient and the giver. And sometimes we can share interests that are related to our vocation, what we did in life as a, a working person. It's like, well, there are some things that other people might benefit from. And that's not unlike, in a sense, my being here with you today, because I'm not actively teaching anymore, but I'm loving this. This is a great gift to me that you invited me to come, so thank you so much. Um, and self-acceptance, I think that's another one of those things that kind of went along with patience that we mentioned a while ago. 
<clears throat> accepting the fact that uh yeah we're maybe not as capable or able or whatever as perhaps we were in the past and also just being able to accept where we are and who we are and accepting other people as well it's like yeah none of us is perfect that's for sure some of us do wordle more quickly than others i dare say yeah and we've talked a little bit about all of this stuff too what else is not up here other ways to manage challenges one of the things that people a guy i remember really well coming up to me and said well you're a musician where's music up there music is not up here on your list it's like oh, yes you're right so we go under <laughs> because really uh, i was part of a study that was fine motor skills that included piano Ooh. and that was amazing the before and after was really interesting and made a difference yeah. in fine motor skills hmm. Now participating in research, that's something that just participating in research through Fox Foundation, through the university, um, was I've done a lot of that as well. That's great. Yes, participating in research can be very, very helpful, not only for you sometimes, but also just in terms of the altruism of giving back to the community, knowing that your participation is ultimately going to be very helpful so uh, that's all important um, do you want to say anything more about getting involved with car I know you've mentioned a few things already I'll a few things at the end okay where we where would you like me to end um, maybe like you know, five minutes okay good thank you um, yeah what do you mean by develop self-efficacy Oh, it's kind of what we were talking about before. It's like being able to set a goal, accomplish that goal, and feel like, wow, I really am not such a lot of sort of person. I really can do this. So one of the examples I always used to use was in terms of exercise. I mean, this is years ago when I was teaching more. It's like, okay, I'm going to try, I would say this class. I'm going to set a goal for myself of walking around the block three times between now and the next class. And I'll do it early in the morning before it gets really hot. Uh, you know, you kind of be specific. And then if you do it, and then keep upping the ante in a sense, you're developing self efficacy. It's like, wow, I really can do that. That's amazing. I didn't know I was capable of doing that. And that's that's what that means in a sense. Just increasing the in fact I need to do that. Thank you for reminding me. <laughs> and um, so the personal resources you have, we all have to get through life and get through PD is being creative, recording memories for your family. I'm sure some of you have done that already teaching others about the challenges of parkinson's some of you have done that probably sounds like you did that at the golf course you were telling people i have parkinson's and so whatever um and we can all be in situations where we can provide that information for people that helps them know what did they do next time when they come uh, across someone with parkinson's there was someone years ago who her husband dropped her off at the shopping mall she went in, she fell down, she was, you know, completely incapacitated in the, the uh, store. And then her husband finally came in after parking the car. And all these people were, you know, swarming around her, all the uh, police and so on and so forth, because they thought she was drunk. Well, poor well, it at all, of course. She had <laughs> And so they decided they were going to create a program that they could present for police um, academies around that area in Canada where they live and they went out and taught people about Parkinson's disease and how you can help people and so on so that was very very helpful for them and for other people I'm sure so 
We've talked about being patient with yourself. Uh, yeah, all those things. And knowing hope and joy in small things. It's like, yeah, all of those things. So anyway, I wanna say thank you for letting me come. I have totally loved being here with you and I appreciate your sharing.